Well, hello, God bless you. Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. here. And I pray that you're having a wonderful day. And I pray that you're having a blessed day, even in the midst of all that is going on. Now, my friends, I am concerned about the condition of the people of our great state of uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, people who have been victims of the storm Helene. And I want you to know that we are organizing an effort right here at the Church of God in Christ. We're also working with Kojic Charities of the Church of God in Christ under the leadership of our presiding bishop, Bishop J. Drew Sheard. And we are uh, uh, going to send in a truckload a truckload of supplies to help the saints uh, in Asheville, North Carolina. If it's the Lord's will, the truck is is, is pulling out this Saturday. We've uh, we've uh, uh, you know until the roads were open, you couldn't get in anyway. And we're giving the saints uh, enough time to collect to give us uh, what they're going to, to give us. Uh, we have, we're taking money and putting money and in, involved, uh, investing in helping the people. We're doing a massive effort uh, to assist the saints who have suffered uh, during a uh, hurricane Helene. Now, uh, listen, we need your help. And uh, uh, on the screen, there is a way for you to help us, uh, help them. 100% of whatever will come in, in its entirety, will go toward this effort. And uh, at the upper room, uh, we're no stranger to doing things like this for, uh, we don't just jump involved when uh, there's a hurricane or when there's a storm, but my friends, on a weekly basis, we're feeding people, feeding families, feeding people. The overwhelming majority of those of the people have never darkened the door of our church. But these are people and they have needs. And I thank God that God has blessed us here at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ with both uh, the goods uh, and the mind to be a help to those who are less fortunate in the community. We want to feed people uh, natural bread and we want to feed them the word of the Lord. So if you will, my friends, join us, uh, send us uh, an offering, send us something where we can put it with what we're collecting and we can be a blessing to those who have suffered. Some have lost everything. Others have had great damage done to their churches. Some have lost their homes and we want to help uh, the people and, and be there and, uh, and do our part. So uh, join us in this effort. Also, my friends, we are yet standing on the word of God. And I want to I want to go to something that I find uh, uh, I find it to be somewhat amusing, but it's something that we contend with all the time. And I'll address it this way. The Bible says this, speaking of some men who had an understanding of the day and the times in which they live. And for those who are who are serious in the Bible, you know, I'm referencing the sons of of Issachar. The Bible says this about this, uh, the tribe of Issachar, the men of Issachar. The Bible says, and the children of Issachar were men of understanding. That is, they were men of insight and intellect of, of the times. They understood. They had insight and intellect regard, regarding the times in which they live. Now, they didn't have insight and intellect, Brother Gary, concerning all times, but concerning their times. And you know what? Uh, and it says that, that they knew what Israel ought to do. That is, they knew what Israel ought to do at the time. You see, my friends, listen. These are uh, some extraordinary times in which we're living in. And uh, I want to say to you preachers out there, you, you have to adjust your preaching to address the defining issues of the day in which you live. Now, we get 
a, 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 a reoccurring question all the time. Why does Bishop Wooden preach about the, the, the homosexuals? And why does he preach about the lesbians? And why does he talk about the, uh, the abortion? And why does he uh, talk about the, the politics and all this so much? And, you know, my short answer is you ought to ask your pastor, why don't you? But my, my position is, my friends, listen, I have an understanding of the times. I see what's going on. I don't carry the mantle of prophet. I don't carry that prophetic title. But I tell you what, and I, and I submit this with great respect and humility, uh, I've been more prophetic than most uh, that I know who call, uh, who, who do hold those titles and mantles because many, the only thing they prophesy about is material things. They talk about uh, creature comforts and the mundane things of this life. God have shown me the wickedness that is going on in society. And he's shown me, shown it through me, uh, to me through prayer and the word of the Lord. And you have to admit for those who criticize us for standing our ground on biblical morals, biblical truths, as we stand and speak out against lifestyles that the Bible calls, you notice the Bible doesn't call them alternative the Bible calls them abominable. And I believe that uh, we're more effective when we lose, when we use Bible language than we are when, uh, when we adopt the language of those who oppose us. See, when you put, when you know how to wrap sin up and make it sound so good, such as uh, gender affirming care, what, and what they're actually talking about is butchery. They're actually talking about butchering a, a, a child, butchering a young boy. You, you're actually talking about uh, poisoning the system of a boy or a girl by giving them mega doses of hormones that their bodies does does not do not naturally produce, or giving them blockers to keep their bodies from producing the hormones that the bodies would naturally uh, uh, produce. This is evil. This is wicked. And then there are those who suggest that this should be codified into law. There are those who suggest that parents, children should be taken away from their Parents, if the parents don't go along with a gender dysphoric, that is, a confused child, a confused child that most studies show that the child will grow out of the confusion anyway. Just give it time. Pray for the child. And how about this? How about this? How about being a parent? Tell the child, go somewhere and sit down. And, and uh, uh, Johnny, you are a boy. And, and Susan, uh, you are a girl, and that's that. And you know what? You know what's going to happen? The Bible tells us what's going to happen. Train them up in the way that they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. And if when they get old, they rebel, well, they're grown, and they're on their own. But my Lord, in the home, in the home, I'm saying to mom and dad, how about being mom and dad? And and don't let these people on television, uh, these uh, uh, woke, leftist, uh, smart sounding people. I mean, they are so intelligent. They know how to make the murdering of a human being in the womb. They call it. Health care. <laughs> oh, I have to laugh to keep from crying. Don't let these people influence you. Oh, we are for women's health. That's cold for killing the baby. And I'm going to talk about it. And I don't know why more preachers do not. And especially, now I'm not going to get racist right now. Um, that, that's, that's, that's not my goal. But I am going to get racial. Especially Preachers, uh, 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 African-American preachers, black preachers, preachers who look like me. When you consider that abortion is the number one killer of black people, the number one killer kills more of us per year than the other five leading causes of death combined. Uh, uh, cancer, heart attack, stroke, COVID, homicides, 
all these things, the sicknesses and disease, combine them and they don't take out as many of us per year as um, abortion does. And shame on the preacher. Who doesn't talk about that? You should you should tell your preacher, if preacher, if you don't change, I'm leaving. You should ask the preacher. Ask, ask for an appointment. And ask him, why aren't you talking about this? And when he gives, I'm telling you what he's going to do. Well, you got to see the big picture. Well, there are other things that are greater. Ask them, what if, what could be greater than getting born? Don't you have to be born pastor to receive a government handout, to get a check, to get uh, college money to go to school, to get a check from the government to, to buy a house? Don't you have to uh, don't you have to be born in order to get proper treatment at the lunch counter? Don't you have to be born uh, in order for the race to survive? Pastor, why are you out to lunch? Pastor, why aren't you talking about these things? Pastor, I hear you mention, I hear every Sunday you're talking about police brutality. But Pastor, have you run the numbers? Do you have any idea how many African Americans, male or female, uh, die per day or per week uh, with, uh, in, uh, as a result of uh, interaction with the police versus how many are exterminated? in these ovens, on these tables, taking these pills uh, from these uh, evil abortion providers who are killing people and pastor, do you not know that 98% uh, of the time the abortion uh, is a form of birth control, it's not due to rape, incest, nor the life of the mother, Pastor, do you not know this? And if you do, Pastor, why haven't you told us? And if you don't know it, Pastor, why don't you know? You're our pastor. You're supposed to know. And you're supposed to tell us these things. Look at, uh, you know, people criticize me. You know, I'm just, I'm just answering a little bit of this, these criticisms here today. I feel like it. But, uh, uh, but uh, I, th these are the issues of our time, which is my point. Uh, they, they they talk about uh, you know I, I talk about the feminist <clears throat> the feminization of black men the feminization of black men the feminization of men but I'm being racial with it feminization of black men and uh, uh, I don't know uh, uh, Debo Samuels I know that he plays for the San Francisco 49ers and I know that he is one serious I think the brother's bad the brother can play but look at this. Look at this. Look at this picture it's right there on the screen. Maybe he's been in San Francisco too long. Now, my friends, look at the purse that he's carrying. That's not a man bag. That's not a man anything. That it appears to be a Louis Vuitton purse. Uh, a man walking with a purse. Now, my, my question to you is, does the young black boy who wants to be a, an athlete, who wants to, you know, he wants to buy his mama a house. And the only way he, he, he can see how he can get his parents, get, get the family out of the projects, get them, get them away, can uh, get, get some generational wealth to them is through sports. So he's, he's training and his hero is, uh, uh, Debo Samuels or some, um, Professional athlete, is it good for him to see this? Is it is it wholesome? Is it enriching for the little boy, for the little black boy? He, he doesn't have dad in the home. Seventy percent of our boys, and I think it may be seventy-two percent now, or more, are born into homes where there's no dad, uh, so they're not being taught how to be masculine. And if the preacher doesn't bring it up, and, and apparently, at least in the pros, the football coaches don't say anything about it, then uh, then our little boys uh, see this as a role model. Do you think that that is a good thing? I don't. And I think it's bad enough for us to mention it, to bring it up, to, to, to say to, the, to those of us who are gatekeepers, who love the community, who love people, who love Jesus Christ, who love that little boy. Hey, man, 
This is not your look. This is not the way. This is not for you. And uh, and most certainly uh, for the little boy to uh, grow up and be confused about his sexuality, confused about who he is. You know, what they say, they say, they say, well, wouldn't, why do you talk about this so much? Have you paid attention to the commercials lately? Have you paid attention to movies? Do you see what's going on in society? Do you see how ubiquitous this is in society? Do you see how it's spreading? Do you see what it has done to our churches? Are you paying attention? Where are you? What are you looking at? If you're paying attention, you know. And there are those who say to me, oh my, in your pursuit of the uh, of the general board, you might want to back off these things. You may not want to talk about them. You may you may want to you know you know you may want to make nice. Well, let me tell you something. I love you too much for that. And I answer my friends to a higher power. To be honest with you, and I trust the higher power, the God of the Bible. The God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with the outcome of the race, with the vote, with whatever is going to go down. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to campaign hard. I'm going to campaign according to the rules. And then trust God. But here's what I can't do. I can't not preach. I can't not uh, 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 tell the truth. I can't uh, back off of uh, God's word. You know, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm about like Daniel, you know, they, they told Daniel, said, listen, man, all you got to do, all you got to do, Daniel, is just for the next three months, you know, told the king, said, let's establish this law that, uh, that no one can pray to any God other than you uh, for the next, you know, from time to time, I say 90 days, no, it was only for 30 days. And we're about 30 days from the election. 30 days. <laughs> Look at this. Uh, all the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains uh, have consulted together to establish a royal statute, a royal law, and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for the next, I, I said the other Sunday, please, I'm, I misspoke, for the next 30 days. Save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. And they put this law in place, the Daniel law, they put it in place because they could not find anything wrong with Daniel's lifestyle with Daniel's work ethic. Oh, I mean, Daniel showed up early and left late. He was a smart man. By now we're dealing with Daniel. This is not young man Daniel. This is old man Daniel. And uh, he was smart. He's established. He's a hard worker. He has the uh, excellent spirit, the Bible teaches in verse 3 of, uh, of uh, Daniel chapter 6. He has an excellent spirit. He's now in 80 years old. Oh my, he has proven himself. He's the man. He's in the administration of the king. He has favor. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar loves him. The king, uh, uh, Darius, excuse me, loves him. The king uh, 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 appreciated him. He's got money. He, he's the man. And others got jealous. And you know what they did? They changed the law. They got political. They got political. And they said, uh, you can't pray to anyone for the next 30 days except to the king. Many of you have gotten political on me and have suggested that unless I agree with you politically, if I, unless I agree with your political candidate, uh, you won't support this campaign. But you have not put any uh, restrictions or any requests or you've given no challenges to that uh, your the person you've chosen politically, even though they have taken positions that are against your Bible, your God, and your church doctrine. But that, I guess that's another conversation for another time. But they said to Daniel, just 30 days, 30 days. That's all you got to do, Daniel. 
Just play ball for 30 days. The Bible says, now, O king, establish this decree. And the king did it. He signed it and made it a law. Verse 9, 9 of Daniel chapter 6. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writings and the decree. Now look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that uh, the writing was signed, when Daniel knew that it was law, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now this is, Gary, this is the part that gets me. As he did aforetime. That is, he didn't change a thing. He kept praying like he had prayed before. He kept standing like he stood before. He remained the same person that he was before. I suppose, you know, if he was a compromiser, he could have said, well, okay, God, okay, you know, God, I got to have some sense now, God, you know, God, you know, you know, this is the real world, God, you know, and, and God, these people, you know, these people are serious. Uh, so God, if you just, you know, I'll see you 30 days from now, or I'll pray to you, but I'm going to keep my windows closed. I'm going to keep my thoughts to myself. I ain't going to say anything. I'm not going to make any noise, God. Oh, God. And uh, maybe, and, and, and after 30 days, they'll hear me praying like I, like I used to pray. Hallelujah, Lord. Move by your spirit, Lord. Oh, Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. But now for the next 30 days, Lord, I can't say anything because I don't want anybody uh, to be mad at me. And God, I don't want the king to throw me into this lion's den. No, he said, no way, no way, no way. I'm going to do what I've been doing. I'm going to pray like I've been praying and I'm going to trust God with the outcome of my life. Uh, and and uh, uh, to me, the greatest passage of scripture in all of the book of Daniel is one of the greatest passages of scripture to me in all of scripture. And it just simply reads this way. The first clause, then said Daniel unto the king. Then said Daniel unto the king. And <laughs> the reason this moves me so is this is uh, Daniel has been now. Uh, by now thrown into the den of lions. The lions were very, very hungry. Um, they threw Daniel in, left them in there all night long. The king lost his sleep. He realized that he had been had. And um, Bible teachers, uh, verse 19 says, then, and I got to wrap this up. I got to wrap it up. Uh, then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable, vo a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thy servest, here's the key, continually, is thy God, I'm, 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 I'm reading from King James here, is thy God whom thy serve continuously able to deliver thee from the lions? Uh, was was he able to deliver you, O Daniel? <laughs> then verse 21, then said Daniel unto the king. Because you know, if Daniel could speak, the answer is yes. And God delivered him. And I believe, I serve, I know for a fact that I serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I serve the God of of Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah. I serve the God of Ezekiel. I serve the God of Daniel. And we'll just trust the Lord. 
but we're not going to change because uh, the times dictate that the preacher preach the word of the Lord and that among the things that we, we battle for is biblical morals. You see, saints, we're in, a, we're in the greatest cultural battle that we've ever been in and nobody is playing just to be playing. Everybody on both sides, whether you're born again or not, everybody's playing for keeps. Now, some of you, you may be playing games, but Satan's not playing a game with you. Satan is playing for keeps. And we've got to make sure that we're standing on the Lord's side. Now, as I wrap this up, I want to mention something to you that I am excited about. It's on the screen there. I have received an invitation that has just certainly honored me. My brother in the Lord, oh, my friend, he, we, we both, we laugh that we're just two exits apart. The Bishop Stenneth E. Powell Sr. is celebrating his 34th pastoral anniversary. Bishop Powell has accomplished uh, tremendous things in this city in his 34 years of ministering here. I praise God for Bishop Powell and I thank the Lord for Abundant Life Church of God in Christ. He is the jurisdictional prelate of the second jurisdiction of North Carolina and he has invited yours truly to be the guest speaker for his pre-anniversary service and the theme is the audacity of faith. Matthew's Gospel chapter 17 verse 20 through 21. I am so excited about being with my friend tomorrow night, October the 4th, 4400 Old Pool Road, Raleigh, North Carolina. All roads lead to 4400 Old Pool Road in Raleigh, North Carolina tomorrow night where we will be with my friend and brother, Bishop Stenneth E. Powell Sr. Bishop Powell was so gracious and so kind to endorse my run for the general board and to allow me to speak to his uh, jurisdiction. I am uh, uh, excited about being a part of this anniversary service to honor such a mighty man of God. Now, listen, meet me tomorrow night. Uh, at uh, Abundant Life, Church of God in Christ, 4400 Pool Road. But tonight, <laughs> I know you, maybe you were thinking that I'm not going to be in town because I've been talking about this. But saints, I'm excited because tonight, 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 this Thursday night, tonight, tonight, I am, praise God, going to be here at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ for Bible study. <laughs> Woo! Listen, I don't know if you're glad to see me, but I'm glad to see you. Woo! My Lord, I'm going to be here on Thursday night. We're going to be teaching the word of the Lord. Just, just Bible study. And I have a word. I'm telling you, I have a word. I want to talk to you about something that is so important that will enhance your life, that will bless you, that will cause things to turn for you in this life and then in the life to come. Uh, uh, I got it made. So in, in this topsy-turvy world with everything that's going on, and uh, I'm going to close this with a prayer. I'm praying for the nation of Israel. I'm praying for the families of the victims of the storm. I'm praying for members of greater North Carolina, NC third, the second jurisdiction. We all have people who have been affected we are putting our uh, uh, shoulders to the plow and reaching out. We thank God for our presiding bishop and the national church, the Church of God in Christ, Kojic Charities. I want you to know, you know, our church gets so much criticism, but I want you to know that uh, before I could call Kojic Charities, the presiding bishop had directed Mother Sylvia Law to reach out to me and to give us a call. And the Kojic Charities called and said, Bishop Wooden, 
what can we do to help? All we need to do, know is we just need to know what the needs are. Send us some photographs and we will help. And before I could get back to Kojic Charities, Kojic Church of God in Christ Charities called me again and said, we're waiting to hear from you because we want to help. Now, I, I listen, I appreciate that. And I think it's worth mentioning. Many times we are so quick to criticize, but I appreciate our great church. I love this church and I thank God for our presiding bishop. He's a busy man, but he's concerned about the saints and the members of the church of God in Christ, especially those who have uh, uh, suffered losses, uh, who've been affected by uh, the storm. So we, we certainly do appreciate him. And my friends, listen, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity. And listen, whatever you send, Brother Wooden, there is no, now listen to me, there is no administrative costs. One hundred percent of whatever, right now, right now, Whatever you send to help us in this effort will go toward the effort. So I thank God for you. Thank you. And join me tonight right here at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. God bless.